Today, I have Omar Elatar, the CEO and podcast host of The Passionate Few, who interviews people like Grant Cardone, Jordan Belfort, Ed Milet, with over 11 million listeners. Omar's a rock star. <laughs> so look, yeah. you guys ever get a chance to do an interview with that guy? You should do it's it, 100%. Good. He's okay, unbelievable. It. It's true. In this episode, he walks us through his journey from literally selling Tesla cars all the way to standing outside of a restaurant waiting for Grant Cardone to come out to get his biggest break to now running a multiple seven figure production company and what he's doing in between in order to scale those companies up while he's being able to live the life of his dreams, go visit and spend time with Tony Robbins or even build houses in Mexico. Tell me what is one decision that you've made that has made all other decisions in your business easier? I would say something, but the camera's already rolling. I don't necessarily want to sell the business, but I realized if it's built on me, that is a cap and a limitation. So now it's about building systems. Many business owners are managing their own companies when they could establish their own additional company that's called a management company. To me, it's just about building systems so the business is fully automated, and then it frees me up to A, think bigger and build teams around it, and B, um, start doing th more things that I enjoy younger. Omar, I ask everybody the exact same question. First thing they come on here, mm -hmm. what is one of the simplest decisions or systems you've put in place inside of your business that has made everything else so much easier? Uh, number one would be delegate your insecurities. Delegate your insecurities. Yes. So outsource your anxieties, either one of those. Interesting. Uh, because I have found, you know, for me in life and business, you know, I have a YouTube show, I have a podcast and I have a business. So I'm involved in a lot of different things. But I also know my skill sets and I also know my limitations, right? And so similar to like stuff you teach, I've learned that if you, you don't have to necessarily be good at the thing yourself, but if you can build good systems around the thing, that's all that matters. And when you first start out, you don't know that. So I think the best decision I ever made was to build a great team of people around me whose my weaknesses are their strengths. What was like some of the first few things that you were like, yeah. these are my weakness, I need it. And was it that you were like, this is my weakness, I need to delegate it? Or were you like, there was a catalyst point where mm -hmm. you were like, if I don't get rid of this right now, I'm going to stop doing podcasts or YouTube forever? Um, well, there's twofold, right? So when you go back to the decisions, right? One decision was when I was working at Tesla, I was like 25 years old. And dude, I was like in debt 30 grand. I That was my last job. It was like in 2015. And I was in a rough place and kind of everything in my life was kind of rock bottom for me at that point. I had a significant other. And for the first time ever, I was always like the man with girls at the time, right? <laughs> and so for the first time ever, she broke up with me. So my ego oh, was wow. devastated. Yeah. So I had nothing at that time. And the decision I made was like, you know what? F it. I don't know if we can cuss on the podcast. Yeah, you're but good. I, was, I don't care. But I was like, yeah, like F it. Like I, I was like, I'm tired of being in a low point. And she was like the only thing I had. So... When she left me, it was like, I don't have a girl. I don't have any confidence. I don't have anything moving for me momentous wise. I'm in debt. You know, I'm getting older. I'm seeing my friends starting to do well and I'm 25, you know, so I'm starting to feel like, ah, oh, like, is it ever going to happen for me? And before this, I had, you know, my, my past is in skateboarding. So I had all these momentous things with soccer. I was always really good, but I never finished it like to go pro. Skateboarding, I was always really good. Got to travel. Rob Dyrdek all over the country. Got to work for Street League Skateboarding meet all the top pros in the world, skate with them, but I never went pro myself. So I had I had a string of dreams that didn't that were happening but didn't quite come to fruition. Yeah. And here I was right before Tesla knocking on doors selling solar, hawking cars. So there was a lot I tell you this because there was a lot of disappointment. So in that rock bottom moment, the decision I made was like, you know what, F this, I'm tired of losing. I'm gonna go all in on my dream, on my vision. And that was like the first best decision I made. The next best decision to to answer your thing about delegating, building a team was hiring an assistant. That changed the game for me because once I hired somebody and I, you know, and a lot of people get anxiety, right? When's the right time to hire somebody? How much cash should I have before I, you know, consistent cash before I pay somebody? I don't want to go broke, right? Like yeah. the limited beliefs of that. But uh, I had hired, um, you know, I, I remember it, it even starts like in high school. I would like sell boxes of chocolate. I'd buy the box of chocolate, 30 chocolates for like 10 bucks at Costco. And then I would go sell them on campus. I'd make $20 profit because I sold each chocolate for a dollar. Nice. So I bought it for 10, I'd sell it for 30. So I started selling multiple boxes a day. And then I started leaving them in classrooms. 
And literally, it was like at the end of the day, I would collect cash because I would leave my uh, 30 boxes of chocolate, like six different teachers' room, first period, second period, third period. So kids would come in, buy the chocolates. So I, you so know. So it's just like an honesty thing where it's like they'll leave the money after they take the chocolate? Yeah, the teacher regulated it. Oh, if somebody wanted to buy. Did and you I, ever give the teacher a cut of the action? I let them have as much chocolate as I want. Oh, so the deal was the chocolate. Yes, oh, but teachers don't want to abuse a little kid's business sure, or the product, sure. so they'd only take like one or two. <laughs> so the margins were worth it at the end of the day, I'd collect money, but. Even in high school where it started was I had a buddy named Jake. Shout out, Jake. And uh, I asked him because I got tired of walking alone. I had a little backpack with like a fridge. And I had all these ones, you know. If there was girls behind me in line, I'd like Wait, buy a backpack lunch. with a fridge? You said you yeah. had a backpack with a fridge in the backpack? Yeah. I, had, I would put ice packs because chocolate melts. Yeah. So, you know what? I'd be walking around campus. It gets hot in the locker. So you had like a little mini fridge. I had a little operation. That's yeah, weird. man. And, and then in high school? This was high school, this yeah. This is very innovative stuff, man. And, yeah, and I and I learned early on, like, um, I can't do this alone. So yeah. then I started paying kids to, like, have the boxes. My buddy Jake, I hired him to, like, walk with me. And if, you know, if I thought kids did well, I'd charge them two bucks if they had, like, a lot of cash, right? If they were, like, the rich kids. <laughs> uh, you know, so I just, you know, it was, like, a first taste of, like, the power of getting people to help you and sure. you know team team dynamics so interesting and that so later. that was the first hire that you made and and then obviously and i remember you told me the story about the the pro skating and when you right. you and i talked beforehand which is uh, skate life yeah skate life for sure which is nuts to see how far you kind of come as well and like so crazy. in the actual uh so you run the passion of you mm. unbelievable podcast i've had the pleasure of being on it you've interviewed people like grant cardone ed my jordan belfort you have 11 million listeners so obviously you know what you're doing on that side of the business but it like and i'm gonna go into in a little bit sure. how you're getting those people and how you grew the podcast because that's even something I'm curious about, right? Like mm -hmm. just even as we're growing this podcast. But what was that first delegation looking like on the content side when you started building the podcast and the YouTube channel? Was it like, okay, I'm the face. I just need to hire everything else out. Were you yeah. doing all the editing yourself? Like what was that kind of progression? That's a great um, question. And if you had to go back and look at it again, would you do that exact same order? I would have done it exactly the same way. Oh. Uh, and it's funny because you don't always say that. People, yeah. people will say that a lot, but... I have found that to be true only a few times, but when I started, dude, it was like a burning desire. And I don't know if you feel this way. I just interviewed Patrick Bet David. A lot of people, and I know you have a lot of students and clients you work with and help. A lot of people get stuck on the how, yeah. right? Like how to do something. But I have found that when you have a burning desire and you just give it honest, imperfect action attempts with your best guess, that is good enough over a long enough time horizon if you're willing to like not let go of it so my point is that i had a burning desire i didn't have any money so i couldn't pay videographers and editors or anything like that so i personally would dm you know tom bill you i dm'd um you know the grant cardones like i remember even grant cardone one time my homie was like oh you can't and i was like bet me a hundred dollars i can't so he was like all right you bet a hundred dollars and what did i do i just picked up my phone i went to grant cardone you know, dot com, saw the contact us website, called the number, had no idea what I was going to say. My heart's racing. Talked, you know, ring, ring. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is X. I was wondering who would be the boys, best point person to talk to on Grant's team. They said, oh, that would be his assistant. I don't want to say their name so people don't, you know, email in or whatever you know, to respect their stuff. But they told me her name and I said, okay, perfect. By any chance, is she in? And they were like, yeah, actually she is. So boom, within 90 seconds of my homie making the bet with me, I'm talking to Grant's assistant. Oh my gosh. So... Um, and I kind of did it on a like on a little bit of like a, I didn't know it would work. You yeah. know, it's kind of like you know you confident in some things and it kind of works. But wait, wait, what did you tell her? Because you this at this point you don't have like a Zero. following. Yeah, Zero. exactly. So Zero. what what are you saying to this yeah. lady? I have a podcast that's in post production right now, uh, interviewing heavy hitters. I, you know, I hate to admit it, but at the time it wasn't really entirely <laughs> true. true. <laughs> hey, the, I get it. The no, intention, no the intention was, was true, <laughs> and uh, and it ended up being true because we had a lot of interviews. But yeah. I said we were in post production so that I sub communicated that it was in momentum. Yeah, they were being filmed, but the subtext was they aren't edited yet. That's why they're not on YouTube. So they're not. So she's not going to say, "Can I have a link?" I'll say, "Yeah, absolutely." As soon as we'll go live, I'll send you a link. But as mentioned in the prior email. We're in post-production. Got it. Burning desire, really caring, made me word it that way. Yeah. Logic would have had me word it like, hi, can I interview Grant? No. Damn, I tried. Yeah. Right. But when you care, you'll 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 tweak it that extra little bit to to at least open the path. And so long story short, I did that, but it didn't work. But it got that far and they kind of shut it down. And then later, um, and this story's kind of got popular, but I actually saw that this is how I ended up actually getting Grant uh and Elaine on the podcast, my first episode, you know with a big name ever, my third podcast probably. 
And I saw on their Instagram story that they were in Beverly Hills. And they're usually in Florida right here in Miami. And so literally, I saw that they were on their Instagram story at a restaurant maybe like two hours away in Beverly Hills. So I was like, oh, this is crazy. Like, should I? Like, this would be so weird. Like, do I just go there and ask them? Like, it's a crazy idea. But I was like, you know what? F it. Nothing in my life was working at that time. And I was just like, F it. Had nothing better to do that day. I said, fuck it. This is either going to be an epic failure or an epic story. And it's funny later now that it became a story. But uh, I drove two and a half hours to Beverly Hills, waited outside the restaurant. So you knew the restaurant they were at because of their Instagram story? Yeah, because in the background, very faint. Like, you know how Grant does selfie videos? Yeah. And in the background, I just hear Lena like, hey, Grant, do you still want to go to uh, McLean's at 8 p.m. in Beverly Hills? Or whatever the name of the restaurant was. And I, I knew where it was. I had just seen it. And I was like, oh, this is so crazy. But I said, screw it. Let me just go. So I went just before the reservation straight stalker mode at this point yeah, but I, was gonna say, I know it's, it's so weird mode. but it was just like i just had at that time of whatever it takes yeah i love that the dream you know yeah. it, it wasn't about logic and reason and like how do i do that right it was just like fuck it just go, go for it yeah just go and uh dude and i parked my 2013 toyota corolla like across the like corner you know so nobody was i couldn't afford valet or anything like that and I just waited at the restaurant, like adjacent to it. And uh, how much is your heart just racing? I can imagine just like sitting there waiting to go out. You're probably playing the scenario in your head like 10 million times <laughs> what you're going to say. Like, yeah. I'm like nervous right now just thinking about it. And we already know what happened. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, dude, I was in just racing anxiety and my heart was just beating like crazy. And I just remember thinking, like, man, what am this is. What am I doing? This is stupid. Da, da, da. But I just like, I just kind of kept myself cool. That's why later, like, you know, when I've had friends who are like nervous with like girls or what I text this girl or go up to this girl. And I'm like, dude, my nerves have been stretched so, so high much. doing these <laughs> interviews because dude, I didn't have any money at this time, you know? So I had zero confidence. I'm here interviewing billionaires. I could barely afford the parking in the garage yeah. of their place. And, you know, like there was a lot of like imposter syndrome, a lot. And yeah, my heart was racing. And finally, like, you know, I, the door opens, my heart's racing to see if it's them, it's not them. Every time the door opens and closes, my heart's <laughs> racing, is it them? No, it's not them. Dude, for like an hour. This is exactly, anybody that's listening to this that's a stalker <laughs> right now, they're like, yeah, that's exactly what I feel all the time. <laughs> yeah, but I had, you know, I had good intention, yeah, you know? I know, I know. It was like, um, it was just, it had to happen, man. And so, so finally they come out, I kind of find an elegant time to, you know, pr you know, approach them gently as they're waiting for their car and valet. And I said, hey, Grant, you know, my name's Omar, big fan. I, I saw that you were going to be here, and I just wanted to come shake your hand. He was like, oh, man, thanks. I appreciate that. You know, come grab a photo. Uh, if you want, we can send you this photo. So I took this photo with Grant and Elena and uh, got to talk to him a little bit. And I said, you know, by the way, man, I know this is a crazy ask, and you'd never do this, uh, you know, but I know you guys are in town for a little bit here and I would love to come to you guys interview you for an hour if you'd be up for it. I know you normally say no. I know you only do big podcasts, right? I brought up all of their objections in advance, right? I studied his stuff and uh, I was like, but yeah, if you'd be up to do it, man, consider me the young man you once were, like, you know, who, who wanted the thing for a dream. I literally went straight for the cold pitch. Yeah, you did. Like vulnerable, honest. And he was like, damn, he was like, that takes guts. You drove all the way here to ask me that? And I was like, yes, sir. And he was like, you got a business card? So I I don't know how I had one, but somehow I don't even have a, a business. What year is this? This is 2016. Who has business cards, man? I guess, yeah, 2016 maybe, yeah. Yeah, he asked me. I think it was a smoke screen of like, oh, yeah. maybe, like, oh, yeah, you got a card, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. get in touch. But I had one, and he was actually super impressed. He's like, wow. He's like, he, like, respected that. I was, like, prepared, you know? Yeah. Um, And it was funny. It said, like, executive producer, all this. Dude, I didn't know what you I was doing. You just got to love that. That's yeah. like the original Instagram bio that's like <laughs> entrepreneur, but you're not doing shit with your life. That's like, that's what a business card is. Yeah. No fact checking. And I had my here. real estate, I had tried real estate a year prior. So it's like a real estate photo. I'm in a suit, you know? And so I gave him the card. And my, my card said like real estate agent, uh, producer, podcaster, like <laughs> yeah. just everything. everything. Yeah, everything, you know, whatever. And uh, so he was like, yeah, all right. He's like, I like you, dude. I'll, I'll give you your interview. You know, three days later, you know, we did the interview. I had no money. So I literally committed first. They were like, the only day that's available is like Tuesday at three in Malibu. We filmed it right on the water. And uh, they were like, can you do that? I had no money, no videographer, no nothing. And I just said, yeah, we'll take it. Right. Commit first, figure out the rest later. 
Hey guys, really quickly, if you're getting value out of this, please be sure to share it wherever you share things. Share it with your friends, your colleagues, your employees, share it to somebody that you know needs to hear this message. We put an incredible amount of work into these videos and these episodes for you. And all I ask in return is for simply to share it to somebody else that wants to hear that or needs to hear this message. All right, let's get back to it. So I find this camera crew, they charge like 550 for it last minute and I didn't have any money. So then I called local real estate offices and got one of them to like fund and sponsor it at break even cost. So I got somebody else to pay for it and sponsor it. And then I got to kind of shoot it and it'd be on my show. We did the interview, do like imperfect action, this whole thing together uh, with no money and talk about creative finance, right? <laughs> and that interview ends up to do the, ends up being the number one most watched and downloaded interview in the world at that time with Grant and Elena. Got like oh, hundreds, no way. Of, hundreds of thousands of views. I became wow. an affiliate, started generating revenue. So affiliate for what for his for uh, Grant Cardone? They had just started 10x, so affiliate commissions on that and Cardone University. Oh my and gosh! So it was like the perfect time, and it just hit. A lot of YouTubers kind of. I probably got kind of spoiled to be honest, because yeah. right away. I just got massive views and then it was easy to get the Ed Milets or the next one, you know. But it was a string of just, even Tom Bilyeu, billion dollar founder of Quest, I DM'd him like 12 times, no response. And then the 13th time, he was like, yeah, sure, come to my and house when you're, in Beverly when Hills. And you're DMing them, are you like, is it video DMs? Or is it text DMs? Like, what are you saying in this DM? Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. So this worked This worked like a charm. I, have it, I had it inside my podcast course. Um, but basically... It's like the four, like the four elements, right? So number one is like, hey, their name, right? From one of the most powerful things I learned from my first personal development book was how to win friends and influence people. Everybody's favorite sound is their own name. Is their own name. That's right. And it's the same is true with the DM. So, and now it's not always the same on Instagram DM, but before it shows you the first couple words in a yeah, DM. Yeah, before it truncates it. Exactly. And so when, when I would scroll in the DMs, I noticed the thing that stuck out was emojis. So I thought to myself, if I could put emojis in name, right? It's not a game of guaranteeing a response. All you want to do is maximize the odds, yeah. right? Just You're just playing you odds. Just to read it, just to exactly. open it, yeah. Yeah, and I learned that you're not trying to get them to read the whole message. You're trying to get them on the hook on the thing. Once they click that, I found that like just certain, like visually it should, can't be a big block. You want to space it, be clear. So it would be like, whatever. Uh, hey, Tom, quick question. And the emoji would be like a camera with a world globe. So it's like a video camera filming globe. So any emoji, a smiley face, didn't really matter, to be honest. Just one or two emojis. And then, you know, hey, Ravi, dash, quick question. So their mind goes, oh, quick question. So now you're, you're earning, it's like copywriting. You're earning the permission of the next step. So an emoji caught their eye, their name is there, and you say quick question. So there's a subtext assumption to the mind of like, oh, this will be an easy read. Yeah. And then compliment, right? So compliment. Uh, Ravi, big fan of your latest episode of the podcast where Tom talked about how he ran ads for Facebook. Boom. A personalized compliment that's genuine. Yeah. So then people are like, oh, he cares about my work or my book or the chapter three or this episode, whatever. And then a question. So compliment, you give them context. Hey, my name is Tom. I have a, you know, I have a podcast interview show. would love to interview 30 minutes. And then the last thing would be question. A simple ask that's clear to the next step. You know, who would be the best point person to talk to? to see if there'd be some time on your schedule to do an interview with you. So I'm not saying, can I interview you? I'm saying, who would be the best person to talk to? No, oh, that's huge. So right away, they'll be like, oh, it's me. You ask me. Or, oh, my assistant Katie, here's her email or whatever. You see, so I learned patterns because I would get rejections, but I was so after the dream that I just trial and error. What was it. your hit rate on like people that were like big? <laughs> what was your hit rate on like getting a response? Reading was pretty good, man. I'd say probably 70 to 85% wow. would read it. Wow. Um, but this is before a lot it of the like automation and boss. Yeah, and, spammy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, dude, and actually I see that script that I created. A lot of my friends Other always send it to it? me. <laughs> dude, a lot of people use it. Really? Emoji. You know, next time you see them, check them out. Yeah, yeah and it's crazy because it. that was in my course originally. And, like, it, it got adopted. And I can confidently say that, like, that, that wasn't around before I started teaching it. That's crazy. That yeah. is nuts. And so uh, you had Grant Cardone. Obviously, that uh, blew you up and was a huge stepping stone to where you're at today. And then you're kind of doing the DM thing. And then, like, eventually, do are you still reaching out to some of these big people? Or do you get to a certain, like, critical mass where yeah. people are kind of coming to you now and, like, hey, I want to be on your podcast? And even if they're, like, bigger names. Yeah. So it's definitely critical mass will get you in momentum. But the thing about the YouTube algorithm is like critical mass can change at any time. Yeah, at an instant. Yes. And and if, you got, if you're going to play the game, you really have to play the game. 
and you really have to play on offense. And there's sort of, you know, and we have clients where we help them with this, but everybody has a different strategy. So if you're after hyper growth and you're playing the Mr. Beast game, it's very different than if you're building a brand or a video content show or podcast to vertically integrate with your business. Yeah. Right. It's like a certain amount of like, you want to keep it on subject, you know, so. I think those decisions need to kind of be made in advance. It's literally the like kind of where we're at with our our brand and our podcast and our mm -hmm. YouTube. It's like, you know, I could make videos like here's five ways to make a hundred dollars today because right. that's what's gonna get views. But is it on brand and mm -hmm. like you said, vertically integrated with the business? And I think that a lot of people don't put the thoughts in yes. like I, I like you just said, in advance of like what do I they're just making video after making video. Dude, that and is, I can tell you right proactivity now. Proactivity is the key. To all, and I'm sure you know this with systems, right? It's like you anticipate the road ahead, and the more you can build frameworks in advance, the more set up you are. But for I think those in, in in other people's defense, I yeah. think that you do have to start and just throw shit against right. the wall. Spaghetti. But I d will say that at some point, it's important to like reflect, and and we've done this multiple times, and we've just. You know, my creative director and I, we've just been like, all right, you know what? We're just going to stay in this niche that we're in right now because we tried the whole almost like Alex Ramosi, like big viral uh, kind of Grand Cardone things for a little bit. And not only did I not really enjoy making them, which I think is the most important thing, dude, but dude, also the 100%. algorithm didn't really like it either. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think because I think, you know, I have a I have a life coach. I know we talked about this prior because right? yeah. I have business coaches, but I also have life coaches. And for me, is it's all about the lifestyle, right? Like. I believe in life you're either, you know, scaling your peace or scaling your chaos. And sometimes scaling your chaos is more money. Yeah. Sometimes it looks like peace, but it's really how it feels, right? Life is a set of emotional experiences, at least in my belief. Probably short-term more money. Um, well, it's definitely important, but there are trade-offs, you yeah. know, at, at different points. And if not built right, I mean, just to give, you know, an example, I'll overly simplify it. But let's say, you know, you're looking at making whatever. $10 million a year, right? Or having a business that's 10 million a year. Say there's, say we take three different people that gross $10 million a year that net 5 million a year. Let's just, for example, say that. Not all three are enjoying it equally as much. Not all three have the right systems in place. Not all three have other areas of their life they're able to balance out and enjoy, right? And so I think it's about, you know, realizing that the number is part of the, is part of what you're after. That's fine. But Where's the line of where it's at the expense of the other areas of life that are yeah. important, you know? Because if you're going to scale it, you want to scale it in an enjoyable way, not always in it. Well, I think also, uh, I, it's so funny. You're, you're mentioning so many things right now. I'm, so I'm literally reading... Um, uh, Dan Martell just came out with a yeah. book called Buy Back Your Time. Yeah. And it literally just came out with it and I'm reading it right when you walked in, I was reading it. And he's, and obviously, I'm sure people listening to this right now and you and I, we all know this stuff, right? right. On a foundational level, but it's like anything else, you just got to get hammered in your head 500 Repetition. times before you actually <laughs> like listen to it. And yes. it's so funny because yeah, you nailed it. It's like, even when we're at in our business, there's still things that I'm doing that don't necessarily give me energy that mm -hmm. I could easily delegate out to somebody else. And I think that going back to your term of peace, I don't know if you've read Naval Ravikant's uh, uh, The Almanac, which mm -hmm. is an unbelievable book, but he talks about peace. Like that's really what most people are after. Correct. And happiness is peace in motion. And like I couldn't agree more with what you're saying here and seeking peace in business is a difficult thing to do. Oh, but absolutely. if you identify the things that you're really good at and not only really good at, but also really gives you energy and then right. you delegate out to kind of bring it full circle with everything we're talking about right now. Yeah. Like I'm sure for you interviewing people, right. huge energy giver. Oh. I, I could be mistaken, but like just oh, based on no, what I know of you. Yeah. Absolutely. And then like, I'm sure what is something that you hate doing, but is also part of that entire, like what would be something that <laughs> takes energy from you, but is also kind of that has to happen for oh, you to man. be able to do that. I'll be a hundred percent real yeah, with let's, you. Let's hear it. It's, um, I've been blessed to work with a lot of really good creatives, yeah. but creatives are a different type of breed. Breed. Trust they, me. They come, yeah, I'm, I sure, know. I'm sure you understand, <laughs> I know, bro. I know. It's, you know, and on the outside, it looks like, oh, it's easy. They have a camera and a microphone. You just yeah. make content. What's the big deal? Just keep making. But there's a lot of like, you need feedback, reassurance, creativity, ideas. Sometimes there's ego, creative differences. And that's cool. But usually creatives got into it for their own not collaborative creation for their own vision. And so, um, you know, with good intent, I just think sometimes there's clashes. And I think the people that really do well, like it's one thing to look at people who do well on the outside, but I have found that a lot of times it's just having the right people in place that solves a lot of the anxieties. Yeah, You know, like you're like, oh, what kind of content should I create? But maybe just to play devil's advocate, there's like 
a second videographer that would come in and communicate in a way where you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I didn't think. Why of it like yeah, that. why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Why don't I like sometimes 15 seconds of something communicated well opens up a neural pathway of possibility that like if it was never articulated would have never. I think that's why the Hormozis say that they like to have their media people in person and like yes. even for us we obviously we're sitting in this room and I don't have my content team. You, you're mm -hmm. there, the second podcast I've done before. Uh, second podcast I've done with nobody before. I had two people here every single podcast. Yeah, that's what and I going back to like. I'm this year is all about simplification and leverage for me. So going back to simplification, I like had them change all the equipment in here to make it so I can just click two buttons and get it started. Like yep. I simplified Systems. everything. Right. And so this is the first one. But I will say that, for example, my creative director was here right before he left to California. I was sitting mm -hmm. right where you're sitting and we were shooting these shorts and we had Ryan McGinn. I don't know if you know who Ryan McGinn is, but he's, so the, he's the short form like content king. He's like by, oh, by, yeah, behind yeah. Grant Cardone, uh, Ryan Pineda, all those guys. Yeah. And so he told my creative director, because we interviewed him, like, you know, you, you it's, it's, I think it's called like the act, act like a five year old thing. I forgot the way you used it, <laughs> but it's like whenever someone's filming something, you're like, why? Why is it like that? Why yeah. do you like flying your plane? Why? Yeah. So I would sit here and he'd be sitting right there and he'd be like, uh, so why? Why do you think people should uh, not cook their own food? And I would yeah. say, oh, well, I think it's a waste of time. Why do you think it's a waste of time? Oh, well, you know, because there's a higher level of activities. Well, why is it better to do higher level? And then by the time that we were done, we had this epic clip that I probably wouldn't have been able to do, but because that person was there feeding that to me. Framing it that way, Exactly. Yeah. It, it, like then when they go and post, it's going to flow so well, all of that together. As opposed to like, all right, are we ready? Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. The whole thing Pause. at once. Yeah. All right, do it again. Da -da -da -da. And in my brain, it sounds amazing. But like, <laughs> yeah. in reality, it actually it's like, what might are you not. talking about? Yeah, yeah. I want to, um, we kind of touched on it for a second. I want to take a second to transition now about lifestyle a little bit. Right. I know that's something that you've kind of built your businesses around lifestyle, right? right? And you've right. also kind of had, it's really, uh, it's kind of, honestly, you remind me a lot of myself too, where, you know, for example, next Friday, I'm going to Vail with 45 of my clients and we're mm -hmm. going to do one day for mash, uh, for like teaching and then yeah. two days of just straight going on the mountain, snowboarding, opera ski, that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. it's like, I built this business that really serves my lifestyle instead mm -hmm. of the other way around. Like for me, it's right. like, I'm almost going on a snow trip with a bunch of my friends and like, right. but all these people paid me like quite a bit of money to also do it. Right. And it sounds like you've done something really similar right. with your business as well. Can you kind of walk me through a little bit like, how your business does fuel your lifestyle and yeah. like why is that so important to you at this stage in your life? Yeah, well, actually, it's interesting because at this point, it's actually evolving, right? Because I think goals, you know, a lot of times you you set a goal, right? I'm sure at one point, you know, your goal was to make 10 grand a month. Yeah. And you're like, Phew. and then you're like 50. Phew. And then you're like, is 100 possible, <laughs> you know? And then it just, and then 200, and then it stretches. And then now numbers that were a dream before, if you do them, you'd be disappointed, it'd be your worst month ever, right? Yeah. And so, and so that's the kind of nature of growth. Uh, but I have always found like, for me, my original vision was I want to inspire millions of people. I want to make millions of dollars and I want to meet really um, inspiring people and live in a surreal life. And, and to me at that time, I didn't know what was possible. I didn't know it was possible to be in your twenties and make $5 million or $6 million. I thought that was Crazy, and then I learned about click funnels, <laughs> like every uh, you know, like online, every online, like every online market, entrepreneur yeah. and coach and all that. But uh, no, but no, no disrespect. I, I love that industry, and there's a lot of great people in that industry too. But um, yeah, I just you know, for me, it was like my dream was to make a hundred grand a month and be able to, with my girlfriend on a Monday, go to the movies at noon. Yeah, right. Originally, right, because I wasn't a business guy; I was art guy, and a hundred grand a month. What could I need? You know, yeah, what, what would I need more than that for? <laughs> at that, you know. Looking up, you don't see the overhead and you don't see growth or scale. You don't think about those things. At least I didn't. So to me, that was the dream. And I want to be able to skateboard, hang out. And I so got this there. this is all like pre yes. Grand Cardone conversation. This is like this is once 24, I, 25. This is once I started getting momentum. Yeah, like maybe 26, 27. So... You know, for a lot of the younger people, I'm kind of a late bloomer in that yeah, regard. But for other in, people, internet years, both you and I are like dinosaurs. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we got to have a Shopify store at 19, <laughs> doing like a million a month to to and a BMW to qualify. But um, no, yeah. So to me, it was like that was the dream initially. But then you get there, and then you go, well, what's next? How many times do you sleep in on a Monday? Uh, and go to the movies before you're like, damn, I'm gaining some weight. Or like, <laughs> or like, damn, suddenly it's dipping or suddenly you're not attracting as inspired team members when it's not a mission, right? So cruise control comes with consequence. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that's what I found is that it's it's always about the next opportunity and leveraging it for the next thing and the next thing. And you know, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? The goal is to be a bodybuilder. Did that? Then he you know started doing movies and then you know ran for office. And so I think it's about you know knowing how knowing yourself and knowing how to set goals and, and keep getting to the next level, not getting stuck. Have you read uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography? Uh, I listened to it. Yes, dude. That I, that so that actually I, I've said it a few times. That was the thing that transformed my entire life. I was wow. uh, I was a junior in college. Mm-hmm. I was maybe one. 50 soaking wet uh mm-hmm. and you know i was getting high every day and like i was like i would make every excuse of why i couldn't do anything mostly time and then someone gave me his book and i read it and that was really like the first real self-development book i read that just like clicked immediately and how old are you i don't know how old are you when you're a sophomore in uh college I, i'm oh, so, in college yeah Maybe like 19 ish yeah okay 20-ish. so somewhere around yeah. that age and I remember reading, you know, this guy was taking accent removal classes. Uh, Then he was running a construction company all all day long. Then he was lifting twice a day for two hours each time. And he was filming pumping iron. And he was taking uh, acting classes. And uh, he was, uh, like, tanning on the beach and, like, trying to get tan and actually enjoying his life, going out, having fun friends. And so here I am, like, literally getting high on this couch with a bong in front of me. Like, like, you know (laughs) what I mean? Like, telling myself why I can't go to the gym for one hour in a day. And here's this guy doing a hundred different things from a different country from a totally different country (laughs) like you know with as many like obstacles that you can imagine this guy and here i am privileged everything i want right in front of me and i'm just being a lazy piece of shit yeah and uh (laughs) and that book was the first and i like i was like that was when i first started working out i was like and and i like exercise because it's one of the first things in my opinion that you can do like business you could be at business for three years and not see any noticeable difference right but if you work out for six months, you will see a massive difference like right. if it's consistent workout. And so that's why I love the fitness. Um, and that's why I think he's the epitome of it. But anyway, we don't have to go into that yeah, digression, yeah. but I, that's an amazing book. If you're listening or you should, uh, you already checked out, but I do. So you're growing and you've, you're kind of changing your, uh, mm-hmm. your goals a little bit. And so now obviously you don't want to be on cruise control, but I know you do enjoy like having a great lifestyle. I know you travel right. quite a bit um, right. and we'll get into some of the stuff you're doing in Mexico as well. So like, what is that balance for you? Like, how are you like, all right, I want to grow this and impact these people, but I also want to make sure I'm enjoying like my life over here. Is it you're figuring out day to day? Is it like an allocation of time between both of those two things? Like, how do you decide uh, what is not cruise control, but at the same time, what is also me enjoying my life? Yeah. Loaded question there, uh, yeah. but I love it. It's a good one. Um, <laughs> No, I think, you know, fundamentally speaking, if I go back to when I started, it was always really organic. You know, everything for me kind of happened pretty organic. And so, like, uh, you know, when I left Tesla, I remember my last day, I had like 250 bucks left in my bank account and I, I, I had left my job at Tesla. And the like on the day or the day before I left, there was this guy, this gentleman came in and he was a real estate agent, successful guy, made millions of dollars. And he came in and got a Tesla for him and a Tesla for his wife. And, you know, we started talking. And and I had just started the interviews, like faintly doing, like trying to tinker with it and all that. And so he came and he was like, oh, you know, do you do, you do anything on the side? <clears throat> and I said, well, I'm doing this little YouTube show and, and I'm trying to do, you know, some video stuff. And he's like, oh, do you know how to do like video production? I need it for my real estate office. So I didn't, but I said, yeah, of course absolutely, I do. absolutely I do. <laughs> and so I remember it was like they had a, they wanted to do an intro video and they're like, all right, how much would it cost? You know, send us a, send us a, you know, like a, an agreement of how much it would cost or proposal. So I just sat there and I'm like, I didn't know. Cause I, you know, and this is when I first got introduced to business and I had zero, by the way, I had zero experience with cameras, editing, zero, nothing, zilch, nada. I could turn on and record. I don't know what any of the other settings meant. I didn't know anything. Uh, but of course, when he asked, I was like, yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. So I think I, I think I sent him a thing. I found some friends. I pitched them this idea. They loved it. What'd you charge them? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that. So I pitched them an idea concept first before the, I showed the price and I said, you know, so I got them to agree on the vision first, right? And then they said, yeah, we love it. How much would it cost? And I said, uh, you know, I'll circle back. Talk to my guys, just friends that I had, right? All of us have friends in videography, editing, um, that I had zero experience working with, to be honest with you. Um, and I didn't even know there was levels of good or whatever. I just knew they'd do it, so cool. And I asked them how much they would charge for it, and I think they they said, oh, we could do that for like 2500 
So then I was like, perfect. So then I charged the client. Uh, I think it was the first time was like, is there 7,500? Oh, wow. Yeah. It was like, I did one 7,500, 4,500. on that. Yeah. And I didn't do anything. Wow. I just sort of brokered it. I thought you were going to be like three grand, 3,500, because it's like your first time doing this. And you just went straight for the throat and did 7,500. Dude, I had debt, bro. Yeah, I had, true that. <laughs> I had debt, bro. You know, a lot, you know, I'll be honest. Like, I remember even one time, like, I got into a cash crunch. Or I'm sure you've been there in business. It's like, I got into a crash, cr uh, a cash crunch. And uh, I was short like 30 G's. So I ended up coming with like a 30K offer, right? And ended, and ended up working great. And so sometimes out of necessity, <laughs> opportunity is born. Something. Yeah, yeah, that's win-win. But uh, at that time, yeah, I think it was like my first one was like 4,500 and the next one was 7,500. And then little by little, they started asking for more videos. And so I started making this profit on margin. And I would just kind of like, yeah, all right, Tim, you know, put the camera here. This would look good. And I, and I somehow became the authority and I was direct. And I found out I was pretty good at it. And I found I started doing these videos, and the videos turned out amazing. Like yeah. we started doing real estate videos for multi-million dollar properties. And I do it in an artistic way, and it was great. And so I started making five grand a month, seven grand a month, ten grand a month. So I start, you know, tasting. And how much were you making at Tesla at the time? Uh, I was making so at Tesla before I quit, I was making fifteen dollars an hour, plus seven dollars per test drive, plus a hundred dollars per sold car. Okay. And then after X amount of cars, you get a uh, two thousand dollar bonus. The next bonus, I think, was like four thousand on top of the commission, cool. which is pretty low for the car industry because a hundred dollar flat fee, whether they bought a eighty k Tesla or one hundred and fifty k Tesla, flat fee a hundred. So not not too much money. Um, and that's also why I was like, dude, I'm barely. I'm, if I work my face off, I'll barely make six figures. Yeah. And uh, you know that's why I left. And then everybody who came in. I, you know, I asked them what they do for a living because I would sell them, and none of them were like, "Oh, I'm an employee of this, yeah, this company." Of Tesla. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was always like, "What they own? Oh, I run this. I own this. Me and my wife have this. We own a bakery. We own." So they were all owners. So I, I started to learn the lingo. I started to learn how to talk to sophisticated buyers. I met Bill Clinton's Air Force One pilot, and so that kind of introduced me to like the nuances of of like networking, which would pay off later for the podcast. Interesting. It taught me how to talk to classy people. And, and so, you know. and so, just to kind of close the loop on that, yeah. you were leading us down to how you balance that. So, like, <clears throat> yeah. when you started that, you started making money. You kind of realized that you can start making money without your time being attached to it. And right. so, leveraging team, it, leveraging the, those two things exactly. So, like, how today are mm -hmm. you balancing both your lifestyle yeah. and the business itself? Yeah. So I went on a tangent there, but yeah. but basically, it's just taking that same sort of uh, mindset and then just being able to do it at a higher level. So for example, with our clients, we have teams of like review, revision, content creation, and then there's post-production. And then there's like actually having like a post-production supervisor who like is like the third layer of defense for any kind of imperfections that the editing team may have uh, missed along the way. So I think for me, it's about building systems so that, you know, once I can be the face of the brand, I came from a mastermind with Grant recently, Cardone, and he said there's two things that the ultimate leverage business owner does, um, and that's promote their business um, and invest the cash flow. Right? Those are the two principal functions that you want to build systems for everything else. Um, and so I'm in a process of doing that um, and then figuring out what the sort of bigger play is Yeah. because I have, I have the production part down. Mm -hmm. I got a great team of awesome people and – and I've learned along the way what great talent is and, you know, some of the challenges with that as well. So to me, it's just about building systems so the business is fully automated. And then it frees me up to, A, think bigger and build teams around it. And, B, um, start doing th more things that I enjoy younger, right? Like giving back. You know, I we talked about, like, building homes and um, just sort of being unafraid to, like, enjoy it now instead of just enjoy it later. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And that's like, uh, I've done a lot of speaking recently at different events and almost all of them sent around that similar concept, which is like building a business that serves you instead of the other way around so that you can enjoy life now, you know, and I'm, uh, I, I don't have all the right answers and I'm sure you don't think you have all the right answers either, but I can say that I am significantly happier now oh. than I've ever been. And ironically, I'm working less than I ever mm -hmm. have in the, in the pre and I'm making the most amount of money I've ever made my, it's just, it's funny yeah. and, and how um, life works that way. It's, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like and the you, assumption that it has to be stressful is the is the misnomer in the exactly thing, and yeah. it's almost like uh it's you you because it you can't make money can be eat hard 
And so then when you make money and it's hard, you say making money is hard. But right. also when you experience it, making money can be easy. Mm -hmm. So then you make money and it's easy and you go, making money is easy. Mm -hmm. So it's all this perspective shift and it's, right. and once again, people listen to this and whether they believe us or not, they're having to go through and go through their own journey to kind of um, experience it themselves. Because when people told me making money was easy, I told them, do you don't have 10 grand in credit card debt, so shut the hell up. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. So it's a, it's a different, I can understand <laughs> where people are coming from, but. And there's a reason I just want to add to that yeah. point. It's a beautiful expression. I love it says there's a reason that millionaires go to monks for advice and monks don't go to millionaires for advice oh wow you know? i like that a lot you know and if you think about it you know i have found invariably man like you either do you do the work somewhere yeah. you either do the work along the way so it's a little bit of a maybe not as fast as you would have liked or you do it later when you crash and burn or you do it up front and kind of set a path that's kind of more aligned now, of course, you don't know what When you say do the work, you're talking mm -hmm. about the inner work of exactly, like, the inner of work. like, of exactly. like, what's the game I'm really playing? Yeah. What am I, what do I really want out of all of this? Yeah. Cause, cause, you know, maybe on a cellular level, your number one function isn't to scale your business as rapidly as profitably as possible. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Maybe you're telling yourself it is. And, uh, and actually, it, that would actually be happening if you took care of you first. Right. Um, and so I, and I've had that happen to me. I've had crash and burns where, you know, for me at the time, I remember the first time I made like 250 grand in a month and I literally had like three or four big interviews. I had just started traveling. Clients were buying stuff, you know, buying us flights. And, you know, I, I throw a live event. I post on my Instagram story. We could sell it out, selling $1,000, $2,000 prices at the time. And it was just so easy and flowy. And like, and I'm sure you've experienced times like that where it just seems like sure. everything you're touching is like working. Then you have times where everything you're touching is not working. Yeah. You're breaking and, you know, so I've learned to... um to balance that out and to not be so addicted to the highs um, and, and, and obviously try to elevate the highs, but take care of yourself in the process, you know? Uh, so yeah, man, I love it. I try I, to build it so that it's win-win. So, so well <laughs> said. And I, I'll, I'm going to wrap up the interview on that because that was, uh, I've truly enjoyed this and I've learned a little bit more about you, uh, mm -hmm. than I even did previously. Uh, you're, you're a super talented individual, very, very deep thinking and you know, your access to all these unbelievable people, but yet the, your ability to stay humble is, uh, is inspiring on my end as well. So, um, people that are listening to this right now, they mm -hmm. either want to work with maybe your production team, maybe. Mm -hmm they want to get on your podcast maybe they know someone that can know your podcast mm -hmm. what's like the best place for people to get in contact with you learn a little bit more about you yeah they can find me on instagram at omar underscore the rock star and um, i'm sure we'll have some links in the description down below shoot me a message check out our content or you can check out the passionate few on youtube or uh the podcast we were on a little bit of a hiatus the last couple months but we're coming back full swing with some epic uh, billion dollar interviews. So Love it. Awesome. Great stuff coming up. We'll drop all that in the show notes and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace.